Shalom, YMJA. Super excited to invite all of you and to celebrate with all of you the virtual YMJ Night 2020. And it has been an awesome conference so far. If you're joining us live on YouTube, we have had a virtual conference all week and it has been incredible. Our theme has been 2020 vision and I'm excited to celebrate YMJ Night with all of you now. This entire week, we have been following rules to get the most out of the week. And if you're joining us on YouTube Live, we'll share this rules video with you now. These are the rules for Messiah 2020 virtual style. Thank you to everybody who helped make our rules video for this week. It's been an incredible week. And one of the sponsors that made that possible is the TLV Bible Society. And they've been doing a raffle all week long. And I'm excited to announce our winner for tonight, who is going to win a free TLV Bible. And that is Melissa Minipoli. So congrats, Melissa. We're excited that you won tonight. Thanks for downloading the TLV Bible app. And if you hadn't had a chance to do that, you can just go to the TLV Bible app and download that on your phone. And a lot of us have done that this week, and there is just really great stuff on there. But we wanted to let you know that there's even more available if you subscribe to TLV All Access. And so we're excited to show you this video that tells you all about TLV All Access. Do you love your TLV Journey app? This is an all access pass available to you now. You've got to check this out because this is a multimedia way to engage with the Tree of Life Bible and you're going to become more creative and have more fun spending more time in the Word of God. It's going to increase your Bible literacy and you're going to enjoy God's presence in your everyday life. With all access, you can view the entire biblical art collection. Discover the art of knowing God with me, Danya. You can live a biblical lifestyle with the hashtag Shabbat Life in our expanded lifestyle section. Grow your family with the TLV Treasures devotions with printables and TLV Talk Father's Son discussions. And study the intricacies of Bible translation with the TLV scholars. We've been amazed by the love and support that we've gotten from the community that have gathered around this Tree of Life Bible app. Please help us continue to move forward and to make more and more content so that we can have content for generations to come. We can teach biblical living to a whole new community online. Please join us at TLV All Access, and we look forward to seeing you. Awesome. Well, thank you to the TLV for sponsoring that this week and for providing so much so that we can grow closer to God together. 
And we're just going to take some time tonight to worship God. And so I'm excited to introduce Stephen Harper and the BHS Young Adult Band to lead us into worship tonight. So take it away, Stephen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ravi. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Yeah. It's good to see all of you. I'm so glad that we have a chance to connect with our community via Zoom. This is super awesome, and like, it's just an amazing time, an amazing opportunity that we have to worship together once again. So let's just start out with a word of prayer, and then let's worship. So you guys, raise your hands, get up and dance, like whatever you feel comfortable doing, go ahead and do that, because we're worshiping God together, and it doesn't matter what you do as long as it's in service to God. Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you. Lord, we ask that hearts would be turned in touch tonight, Lord. I pray that our community would be strengthened tonight. And Lord, on YMJ night, I pray that you continue to strengthen the Messianic youth of this nation. Lord, I thank you for the hearts that we all have. And Lord, I just ask that you continue to reveal to us your plan, your vision for our lives. In Yeshua's name, amen. Yo 
you're my joy, you're my everything, and I sing hallelujah, hallelujah, I give thanks.
eyes of worship to you, God. In my steps, may they follow you wherever you may go. Let my love be the love you show. Dying on the tree, oh Lord, I surrender now. So come take all of me. Lord, we bless your holy name. Lord, we ask that we would live the words of that song, Lord, that we would be a sacrifice of worship. Lord, that with every breath we would praise your name, that with every step, Lord, that we would walk out your purpose on our life. Lord, whatever vision you have for us, Lord, we pray that you continue to reveal it to us in your time, Lord that we would be vessels ready to walk out your plan. And Lord, we just continue to sing your praises. You are an awesome and mighty God. There is none like you. There is none beside you. And we lift up your name tonight.
your face. We seek your face, Father, in our homes, in our living rooms, in our bedrooms, wherever we're at, Father, we seek your face. Meet us where we are. I seek your face, oh God. I seek your face, oh King. I seek your face with all that is within me. I long to know you more. I seek your face. I seek your face, oh God. I seek your face, oh King. I seek your face with all that is within me. I long to know you, Lord. I long to be
fear is changing now. Hallelujah. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. And the evidence is all around. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing now. Oh, for the Spirit of the Lord, evidence is all around. Evidence is all around. The Spirit of the Lord is here.
one who changes everything. Lord, though there's things that we just don't understand, we put our hope, we put our faith and our trust in you. Lord, today is the Young Messianic Jewish Alliance, Lord. Though through this pandemic we're kept separated, Lord, you've given us the means to stay connected. And Lord, I pray that your communal vision for us would shine through right now. Lord, our hearts are burning for you. We want to serve you. We want to know you. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son to die for us. You didn't have to do that. But because you first loved us. And so, Lord, whatever plan, whatever vision that you have for us as a community, Lord, we walk in it. We make a declaration right now, Lord. Amen. Yeshua changes everything. And I love the fact that we serve a Messiah who did die, but was resurrected and lives forever. And he changes everything. And my name is Ravi Goldberg. And I'm grateful to be the president of the YMJ because I get to see how God changes lives through the YMJA. And right now we get to hear from Ashley Kustik as she's going to share how one YMJ experience, how through that experience, God used it to change her life. Hi, YMJ. Um, and those of you who are joining us via YouTube, hi, everyone. Um, like Ravi said, my name is Ashley Kustik. I'm from California. So tonight, obviously, I was given the opportunity to talk to you all about the YMJA and how they have impacted my life. So in 2018, I went on the Eastern Europe trip, which for those of you who are, don't know, we went to Eastern Europe to serve Holocaust survivors, orphans, and cancer hospital children. So we went to, to spend time like listening to Holocaust survivors' stories, and we traveled through Poland and Belarus viewing Holocaust memorials. So... I originally was not going to go on the trip, but after talking to Hannah Mann, I really felt that this opportunity um, that I had, if I didn't go, I would totally regret it. So I know that you've heard before, like in the past, that this the other YMJers say that this YMJ trip has changed my life. And I think I can speak for myself and those who went on the trip that our lives have never been the same since after going on the trip together. The phrase never again has brought a new and rooted meaning in, in me. And this is something that I say, I feel, and I do. The trip impacted my soul so much that it inspired me to create a project with some YMJ friends that shares personal stories from people who went through the Holocaust and family, family members who have answer, ancestors who went through it as well. I can 100% look at all of you and say that if I didn't go on this trip with the YMJA, I would not be the person I am today. So going with the YMJA members was even more impactful because we got to connect as friends on a deeper level on like deeper levels as we supported and comforted each other when we face the harsh realities of the Holocaust. I personally struggle with facing suffering and pain. So this is a trip that was, um, I felt a lot of uh, anxiety going on it. Um, but being there and learning what happened has strengthened my identity as a Jewish believer and one who has family members who went through the Holocaust. Uh, if it was not for the YMJ leadership planning this trip, Sabra Waldman for directing it, Hannah Mann personally reaching out to me, um, I wouldn't have gone. And the impact that I experienced, I wouldn't have had. 
Also the impact that those at my university, my friends and my family felt after talking to me when I came home, that would have never happened if I didn't go. So I am beyond grateful to the YMJ and this community because every time I come in contact with this organization, I grow personally. So one of the many ways I've gotten to grow is from the YMJ Freshman Mentorship Program. So this is where uh, I got to meet with a mentor once a week and she spoke into my life in ways that I couldn't even express the depth and impact. I could tell you about it all day long, but we're actually going to hear from a parent whose son went through the, the mentorship program years ago when he was a freshman. So it's an honor to be able to introduce um, Rebitson Janet Foreman. Hi, I'm Janet and uh, this is my son, Ari. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to say thank you to the YMJ. First of all, they're doing a tremendous job on this conference. I heard great things from my young, young people. Um, and as a parent, it's so apparent at universities that it is a place of huge spiritual warfare, that uh, there's anti-Semitism, there's drugs, there's uh, immorality. It's it's a challenging place to be. And not only in those ways, but it's also challenging because it's the first time many of the kids are on their own, living on their own um, outside of the congregational uh, setting and living as Messianic Jews, keeping a Messianic Jewish identity um, on campus is a, a big challenge. And the YMJA mentorship program that Ari went and it was actually with Rob Goldberg. He was amazing. Uh, as a parent, knowing that he was going to meet once a week with someone who was spiritually solid and he could talk to, he could have as a friend, he could ask questions to, uh, it, was, it was amazing to know that someone was encouraging him spiritually uh, throughout his first year. Um, and he was there as a friend. It was a huge relief. I'm really very thankful to the YMJA for this. And I think uh, Ari really benefited in many ways and he's good friends with Robbie now. And uh, I just wanna encourage you if you're, uh, your child is going to university, this is a great program. And I even encourage them to do it past the first year, but um, it's, it's really a, a great opportunity to take hold of. It's a mentorship program. So thanks so much. And I'm going to turn it back to Hannah now. Thank you so, so much, Rebitz and Janet. Mentorship is a huge part of the YMJ. And we do that as we do young adult ministry trips, mentorship, leadership development. We really, really, really care about young adults. And it was so beautiful hearing Ashley share and hearing Rebitz and Janet share. And Ashley and I walked together through Auschwitz and out of the Holocaust came Israel. And it is so, so significant as a, as a believer, as a Jewish believer, to be able to stand in the land of Israel and, and be with our YMJ family. And next summer, June 2020, we are going to have our next Experience Israel trip. We are so excited. I personally went on this trip back in 2012 and it changed my life in ways that I'm still discovering. The other day, Melissa and I in a Zoom room were casually with a young adult, just telling her all about it. You would have thought we were a marketing committee, but we weren't. We were just so impacted personally, sharing about how we got to serve in the land and see the Bible come to life. And honestly, there's a lot of ways to go to Israel, but going with the YMJ is something that is so indescribable. We're going to be going, and I encourage you, if you're interested, if you're a young adult and you're thinking, I want to serve, I want to grow personally, I want to see the Bible, I want to connect with my heritage, I want to stand in God's land, I encourage you to reach out to me after after this week. Email me. We're going to have a video in a minute so you can see pictures and clips, but at the end of the day, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I just encourage you to take advantage of it. Um, there's you know, pray about it. I personally went when I was 18. I have a friend who didn't go when she was 18. And then when she was about 27, she decided the time is right for me. And she came back and she said, you know what? I am so glad I went. So if you are between 18 and 30, I want you to consider this trip. I want you to consider spending about a month with us 
going and seeing the land and growing as a leader and growing with our YMJ family. And I can talk all about it. I can give you so much, so much more. But instead, we're going to let you see a video that shows a little taste of what you might experience if you come. Chernoff, and I'm going to turn it over to our president, Ravi Goldberg, to have the honors of introducing one of our amazing, amazing sponsors. Yeah. And so in the YMJ, our heart is to see all of our young people, all of us trained and launched into God's callings for us in our cities and our communities and our congregations. And so we're so grateful for the work that the that God does through the IAMCS to strengthen congregations and to mm. strengthen rabbis. And so I'm excited to introduce you to the chairman of the IAMCS, Rabbi David Chernoff, to tell us more about the ministry that God is doing through the IAMCS. Okay, thank you, uh, Ravi. And this is a wonderful conference. I can get the feeling of it right now. And there is a precious anointing that is here. And uh, sadly enough, I can tell you that I was around when the YMJA got started. But we will not go into prehistoric times. We will uh, just uh, keep it to now. Uh, you know, in this movement, you have to uh, get all of your acronyms right. You know, there's MJA, YMJA. People ask me, what does the IMCS stand for? International Alliance of Messianic Congregations and Synagogues. And there was a reason why we did it that way. But uh, people say, oh, it's so hard to remember. But I tell them, you know, think of I am C.S. Lewis and then drop off Lewis, okay? I am C.S., that's, that's who we are. But this is the Congregational Rabbinic Organization. Started in 1984. Uh, I was one of the founders of it. Today, we have about 150 to 160 congregations in it, uh, 100 to 120 in the United States, and then about 40, 50 of them uh, throughout uh, Europe and other, other, other countries, um, I think 16 different countries. And I uh, just had a meeting today, another Zoom meeting. Can, how many can say praise God for Zoom? I never even heard of Zoom until this coronavirus. Now we're Zooming everywhere. So we had a Zoom meeting in uh, here, but it was with our European fellowship. And we have about uh, 30 to 35 congregations in Europe, uh, most of them in Ukraine and Crimea. But we, we had a, we're meeting every week now in fellowship, in prayer, planning things. And it's just great what God is doing. So I want to share with you a little bit about the IMCS uh, and the importance of it. But just some of the things that we do, <clears throat> we're the rabbinic and synagogal organization. My father was one of the first Messianic rabbis in this movement, starting one of the first Messianic synagogues in 1970. And uh, I said, Dad, that's great. But I wasn't interested in doing it. I said, I'll, I'll never do what you're doing. I just won't. I'd rather do, do campus work. I'd rather travel and speak and everything else. 
rabbinic work sounded boring to me. But over the years through the IMCS, we have developed great unity within this movement. We, we fellowship with one another. We ordain messianic rabbis, teachers, and other leaders. We deal with doctrinal issues that come up. Sounds so boring, but they do come up and we have to deal with them. We plant new congregations. We send financial support out. We just sent thousands of dollars out to uh, Messianic congregations in Europe as a stimulus package to try and help the congregations. And it wasn't like a million dollars or something like that, but we had about seven, 8,000 that was given. And we sent it out to each of the congregations in Ukraine and a few in Europe, Western Europe to help them. And they're so happy for that. Uh, we have conferences. We have uh, a European conference once a year. We have a, a rabbi's conference once a year. I don't think we're having it this January because of the coronavirus. Uh, I was hoping the coronavirus would be done with and we could go back to being normal, whatever that means, but it doesn't look like it's happening. Uh, we also have a lot of memberships, people wanting to come into the IMCS. Uh, we have a yeshiva. We have a training school, teaching school. We do a lot of mediation uh, between groups uh, when problems arise. But I just want to share with you one of the new uh, visions that we have, and this is heavy on my heart, is the vision to train up uh, 100 new young Messianic rabbis and 100 young women to be in leadership. And why is this needed? Because my generation is getting older. Some of the rabbis are stepping down. We do have young people that are stepping into place, but we need more. But Lador Vador means from generation to generation. God wants us to have this. So I wanted to give you, by the way, a biblical basis. Um, I'm going to ask Hannah, how much more time do I have? Is it four minutes, three minutes, two, five? What do I got? All right, I'll stay on time, all right? So, um, but in uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, and I don't know if you have your Bibles with you, this, I want you to know that Messianic Judaism, this Messianic movement, Messianic synagogues, we are a fulfillment of prophecy. We are a fulfillment of prophecy, and Messianic synagogues are the building block for this movement. Even if it's a small one or a large one, we are the building block, and God has just begun with us. And Jeremiah 23 is a very unusual prophecy about the last days. And I'm doing this the slow way by turning the pages. Uh, God said, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. So he's now talking against the bad shepherds, the false shepherds. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my flock, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for all of your evil doings. So God is rebuking the false shepherds. Then he gives this wonderful prophecy, and we're used to hearing these words. But I will gather my remnant of my flock out of all countries where they have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking. Usually when we get a prophecy like this, God is saying, I'm going to bring you back to the land and the land's going to prosper and, and the, the desert's going to bloom. He doesn't say that. He said, I'm going to bring you back from the countries I've driven you to, and I'm going to put you in folds. And, and sheep folds were where the sheep were. They protect, they were protected. You might put 50 to 100 sheep inside this uh, uh, enclosure. And then he says, in opposition to the false shepherds, I will set up shepherds over them. Well, as I studied and meditated on this and my, with my father as well, came to the conclusion that he, this had to be talking about Messianic synagogues because Yeshua said, I have other sheep that are not of this Jewish fold. He was talking about the nations. We are a fulfillment of prophecy. And I just wanna say one other passage and I want to encourage you this. We are in the process of developing a program for those who are interested, men and women who are interested in leadership 
uh, in the, the Messianic movement and to be Messianic rabbis. I have to excuse me, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obed, okay. Joel chapter two. And uh, we're developing this program and I'd love <clears throat> to interest you. If you are interested in coming into leadership to be a rabbi or to be a woman leader in the, in the congregation, perhaps to be a rabbi and you wanna marry somebody who's a rabbi, I want to encourage, we need you because now God is getting ready to raise up a brand new generation of leaders and of rabbis to lead these congregations. <clears throat> and when I got saved, I was, I got saved in our congregation. My father and my mother started one of the first Messianic synagogues in 1970. Four months later, after they obeyed the Lord, the power of God fell in this youth group prayer meeting. I was 19 years old. And we were changed. I was changed in a moment. I got saved, filled with the spirit and called them into the ministry, even though I didn't fully know it. But I want you to read in Joel chapter two and verse 28. And this is a wonderful passage about end time revival, which we are a part of. And it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, which is wonderful. Great end time revival for all Israel and for the whole world. And we're coming to that despite the coronavirus, despite the unrest, despite the global economy, we are coming to that place of a global revival and to, and to the Jew first, but to all nations. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Now, I saw this passage when I was 19 years old in college. And so I said, ah, there's going to be a revival among the young people. And yes, that was the Jesus movement out of the Jesus movement came Jewish, young Jewish believers, and then other adults, older adult uh, Jewish believers. And they wanted to have congregations. They wanted to have a congregation where we could be Jewish. We could be Messianic for both Jew and Gentile alike. So I'm not the young whippersnapper I once was. Uh, this passage now, it once applied to me, but it doesn't apply to me in the sense that a sons and your daughters and your young men. Although it does say your old men shall dream dreams. So maybe I'm in there right now with, with the old men. But this is a passage of revival for young people, for you guys. This is a season of revival. And there is a calling from God to many of you to enter ministry, to become leaders of congregations, perhaps to work and be trained under your rabbis. Perhaps we will have a program at conferences and other places where you can uh, go to an apprenticeship to where you can get trained in Bible studies and things like that. Listen, I majored in psychology and I was going to go on in psychology. Then I studied for a few years at University of Penn in archaeology and ancient history. I had no idea that I would become a messianic rabbi. But the Lord, when the Lord calls you, you have a desire to do it. And I love being a Messianic rabbi. It's just great. The hardest part for me is all I can do is look at your beautiful faces. But what I'd really love to do is give everybody a hug. But we can't do that now because we're in a coronavirus. Anyway, that is my call and my encouragement to you to think about this. You you're, might be in college, might be in high school. I'm not sure. But it's never too early to start thinking of this, some of the greatest revivalists, some of the greatest pastors and leaders and, and men and women of God got this call when they were a teenager, when they were even at nine, 10 or 11 or in college. I got it when I was in college. So anyway, I wanna encourage you with that. Messianic synagogues are the basic building block of this movement. What will we do without them? And I wanna encourage you to think about this and pray about it. Amen. Can I get a hearty amen? Can they all, can you go like this and say amen? Hey, <laughs> okay, that's called the Zoom response. All right. Thank you guys very much for listening to me. Um, I am Melissa and I am so excited that you are all here with us tonight. Um, what a special night to have. Um, this night truly and really all that the YMJ does all year round truly could not be done without an incredible team of people. Um, there is an executive committee that all year round is planning for and dreaming for and, and casting the vision for 
the YMJ present and future. And so I just want to take a couple minutes. We're going to spotlight everybody and I want to um, introduce who we have. So let's start. Let's start with our president. Where's our president? There he is, Ravi Goldberg. Ravi Goldberg is our fearless president and he is an amazing president at that. He hails from Tampa, Florida, and he um, just has such a heart for truth and a heart for wisdom. Um, and he is someone who uh, we love having lead our meetings and we're super, super grateful for. Uh, where's Hannah? Where's she at? This is like a, it's like a guessing game. Hannah Mann? Hannah Mann, where's she at? There she is. Hannah Mann is not only, she wears a couple hats in the YMJ. She is not only our YMJ secretary, but she is also our YMJ ministries coordinator. So if you uh, go to the retreats or if you have a team that goes to the retreats, um, you will see a lot of Hannah. Uh, she has such a heart for the YMJ. She has such a heart for young people. Um, and we are just so grateful for how that heart manifests in so many ways she just lives and breathes the YMJA. So um, where is our treasurer, our treasurer, Joey Stepikoff? Where is he at? Joey Stepikoff, he is our YMJ treasurer, and we are super, super grateful for him. Oh, I should have mentioned, Hannah comes out of Atlanta, Georgia. Joey is also in Florida, um, and he really just has such a creative mind. Um, he brings such creative vision to all that we do and to, to all the things that we're dreaming up and thinking outside the box. Um, and we are just so grateful for what he brings to our team um, and managing all of our finances, which we're very grateful for. Um, Leah, where is she? Leah Charles, she is our honorary exec. She comes from Long Island, New York. Um, she just has a very, again, a heart for wisdom and seeking truth. Um, she doesn't sugarcoat it. So we love having her in our meetings and at the, the helm of uh, leading things and uh, all the screen sharing by the way tonight is from her. So major shout out and claps to Leah. We are very, very grateful that she is on our team um, for, for a number of reasons, for many, many reasons. Uh, Sabra Waldman, where is she? There she is, Sabra. She is our YMJ Director of Operations. Uh, she does a lot of things that many people probably don't see. She does a lot of the kind of the, the guts and the framework of the YMJA so that everything else can, can move forward. But she also really likes to think outside the box, think creatively, think new ways. Um, and we're very grateful for just the things that she brings to our team. Rabbi Kevin Solomon from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, he is our executive director. Um, he really has such a huge heart for the YMJ. He has such a huge heart for youth ministry um, and for seeing young people grow and succeed. And um, we are very grateful to have his leadership. And I'm Melissa Brown. I am our YMJ vice president um, and I hail out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I guess that's all I'll say about myself. Um, you'll hear a little bit from me later. So we are very, very grateful for our executive committee. Um, and I'm gonna throw it back to Ravi. Great. Thanks, Melissa. And now I'm excited to introduce our first speaker for tonight. He's on the board of the IEMCS with Rabbi David Chernoff. He spent 22 years as a leader in the Navy. But one of the things that has impressed me the most about him is that for years and years, he has had a heart for reconciliation and unity between Jew and Gentile, between Native American and African American communities, so that we can be one and together experience the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our communities. And so I'm excited to introduce Rabbi Eric Carlson. He is a man whose life is marked by discipline and the power of the Ruach. So join me in welcoming Rabbi Eric. Woo! Shalom! YMJA night on the virtual Messiah conference. This is amazing. It's an honor and a blessing to be here. I'm so glad that so many of you have taken time away from your lockdown and your quarantine and pulled away from all those nothing activities and joined us here at the YMJA night. And this is a fantastic evening. I'm talking to you from the birthplace of America, where it all began 412 years ago. I'm here with my daughter, Erica Carlson, who's also on the leadership team of the YMJA. And my granddaughter is here. Uh, Eliana Thompson, also part of the YMJA. So we're going to get it on and bring some fire here this evening. Amen. Are you ready? Let's go. I believe, and I'm going to release this evening 
a generational mandate upon you. Things aren't always what they appear to be. I want to be topical and relevant this evening. Global current events show that the world that we have known unraveling before our very eyes. Pandemics, world unrest, civil unrest here in this nation and across the globe, rioting, looting. We're witnessing a dynamic combination of world events that precedes the return of our King, Yeshua, who spoke of this, this fear, this anxiety, this Zerus that we're experiencing in our world today. In Matthew 24, starting in verse 7, he said, For peoples will fight each other, nations will fight each other, and there'll be famines and earthquakes in various parts of the world. He said, all this is but the beginning of the birth pains. This is just the start. And that word peoples, ethnos, in the Greek, which is a race or people group. So Yeshua prophetically warned us that in end days, we will experience ethnic violence and conflict accompanied by unprecedented times of COVID-19, quarantine, lockdown, rioting, looting, racial unrest, ethnos versus ethnos, storms, earthquakes. We've even got biblical plagues of locusts sweeping across Africa, South America, and even into the Middle East and Iran. Often new beginnings are preceded by painful endings. And this is my heart, my passion. I just appreciate what Ravi shared. Here where I'm at, 400 years ago in 1619 in July and August, the first 20 slaves arrived to America. Slavery began here where I'm at. Slavery ended here where I'm at. Virginia is known as the covenant state. So I've got a passion for reconciliation, for healing. We have never made restitution. We've never made a national repentance for the scourge of slavery upon this nation. We must act and interject ourselves into the narrative and do what God requires of us to bring about racial healing, equality, and justice to this nation. Our world is in crisis. It's an anarchy, and that's causing fear, terror, and panic. But Adonai didn't give us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and self-discipline in 2 Timothy 1. Though the storm is raging, plagues, riots, racism, anti-Semitism, pandemics, even Antifa, and many other challenges, things aren't always what they appear to be. When we boldly stand on Adonai's prophetic word, when we act on it, when we walk in our prophetic destiny, we transition through gates, through doors, through portals, through epochs of time. And you're living in such a time of transition right now. Principalities are shifted, ushering in Adonai's glory as evident through the supernatural healings, restoration, and restitution. I'm a person who's always looking forward, straining forward, as Paul said, not looking backwards to where we've been. Again, I'm going to say this several times, things aren't always what they appear to be. And the first place I'm going to go to is Exodus 17, verses 1 through 3. This is after the Exodus from Egypt. We're now uh, coming out, and the whole community, the people of Israel, left the scene desert, traveling in stages as Adam and I had ordered, and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses, demanding, give us water to drink. But Moses replied, why pick a fight with me? Why are you testing Adonai? However, the people were thirsty for water, and they grumbled against Moshe. For what did you bring us up from Egypt? To kill us, our children, our livestock with thirst? Rephidim in Hebrew means resting place, a place halfway between Egypt and Mount Sinai. Listen, the pillar of fire, the cloud, it stopped at this place, indicating Israel was to camp here, to rest at the halfway point except there's one monumental, gigantic issue here at Rephidim. There's no water. There's no well. What? Why? How? Why didn't Adonai pick an oasis, a river, a well for Israel to camp by? Both livestock and people need water. Adonai could have had a truckload of ice-cold bottled water waiting for us when we arrived there. But with him, all things are possible. So why did he bring us to this seemingly place of impossibility? And to be honest with you, and I think maybe some of you as well, I've often felt this way. Lord, I'm following you. I'm, I'm following the cloud, the pillar of fire. I'm trying to do what you told me to do. But so many times it appears that there's no resources, no money, no people, no shalom. All too often in situations, we jump to premature conclusions and don't see it through God's eyes. There's another example in Judges 6, verses 11 through 16. It said, then the angel of Adonai and I came and sat under the terebinth that was at Ophrah, that belonged to Joash, the Abzirite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press in order to hide from the Midianites. So this is a time of Midian oppression upon Israel, threshing grain in a wine press. I can't tell you how impossible that is, but they're cowering in fear, hiding. 
Verse 12, then the angel of Adonai appeared to him and said to him, Adonai is with you, O mighty man of valor. But Gideon said to him, O Lord, if Adonai is with us, then why has all this befallen us? Does it sound like our times today? All these crisis, pandemics, lockdowns, civil unrest. It, 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 where, where is God? Why has this befallen us? So where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about saying, didn't Adonai bring us up from Egypt? But now Adonai has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Then Adonai, then Adonai. No, she's talking to an angel first, but now Adonai is speaking to him. Adonai turned toward him and said, go in this might of yours and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have not I sent you? Then he said to him in verse 15, me, my Lord, with what would I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the poorest in Manasseh, and I'm the least, Zaire means I'm the youngest, I'm the littlest, I'm the least in my father's house. But Adonai said to him, surely I will be with you, and you will strike down Midian as if you were one man. One person, Gideon, the youngest in his family, perhaps he's 15 to 19 years old, who was in fear, threshing grain in a wine press. Like Gideon, our current pandemic and civil unrest, things look pretty bleak, barren, chaotic, even swirling out of control. Yet appearances can be deceiving. Just because you're from the poorest family and the least, the youngest in your family, doesn't mean Adonai isn't standing with you and working through you. Just because you're not camped by a well, oasis, or roaring river, doesn't mean Adonai isn't in and on the situation with every resource we need. Resources and miracles often come from the least and unexpected place so that his power his power, his glory will be revealed. Quite often, these situations are tests themselves from Adonai. In Israel's case at Revedim, what did it lead to? A miracle. In Gideon's case, what did it lead to? A miracle. God will use situations like Revedim, like COVID-19, like social unrest, like anarchy, rioting, and looting to test and see where our heart and trust is. At Revedim, God had water stored in a rock. He had water stored in a rock. The people immediately, though, they grumbled against Moses and Adonai when they see the current situation, but they're looking at it through humans' eyes, not God's eyes. They looked at their situation, and they lack trust. Things aren't always what they appear to be. Us today, you, the next generation, the future of America, have a heavenly mandate in what God is doing in this hour. A Gideon call to tear down your father's Asherah pole and return this nation back to Adonai. This vitriolic civil turmoil and racism that is currently being exposed in our nation is part of a great move and outpouring of Adonai. True healing, restoration, and revival will only come through a sovereign outpouring of God's healing spirit that will repair the divide between Jew and Gentile. And you think, wait a minute, wasn't he just talking about black a white reconciliation? I, I am. But the top button of all reconciliation is Jew and Gentile. And when we repair that divide, we repair the divide between all races, culture, and color. God is giving you tonight, the JA, the youth of this nation, to be bold, to model his heart's desire for all people unity and harmony. We so often reference Ephesians 2.15 that Yeshua died to make the only two people groups he sees, Jew and Gentile, one a Messiah, to make a new humanity. But the end of this is very interesting that we may have peace or shalom. This is Irene in the Greek. Listen to this. The first line of that is a state of national tranquility. Man, are you hearing this? If we can come together and do this, we will experience a state of national tranquility in this nation. It's the only answer. All the world's eyes are upon you. It's up to you, the next generation, to shma, to hear his voice and boldly interject yourselves in spirit, truth, and power to alter history. Listen to me. 50 years ago, America was postured exactly as it is today. I remember it. I was alive. I was young, but I remember this. The Hong Kong flu pandemic of 1968 to 1970 was raging and claimed over 100,000 lives. 50 years ago, between 1968 and 1970, we witnessed the assassinations of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy, there was riots, there was looting, fires raged across Washington, Chicago, Baltimore, LA, DC, and many other cities. There was campus protests, civil rights protests, the Vietnam War protests, student sit-ins, college takeovers, and continued civil rights marches with public school desegregation. It was chaos and anarchy. Yet what came out of that? Rabbi David mentioned it just a few minutes ago. 
What came out of that at the same time parallel to this was revival. We had the Jesus freak movement. We had the charismatic outpouring. We had the Asbury revival, the birth of the YMJA 53 years ago, the resurgence of the modern messianic movement coupled with the restoration of Jerusalem back into Jewish sovereignty, back to our hands. Listen, hundreds of thousands of people were saved. In this same time frame, we had Oral Roberts, Rex Humbert, Billy Graham were filling stadiums, campus College campuses were an open revival. Billy Graham brought his revival to the University of Tennessee's Nayland Stadium in Knoxville, Tennessee in May of 1970. And this was mostly young people, teens and college age to hear him preach the good news. Over 50,000 people were saved. All of our movement's leaders today came to Yeshua in the same time frame. Here we are now, 50 years later in almost identical circumstances I would even tell you that they're worse than they were then. But the greater the storm, the greater the revival and outpouring. And once again, it's the young people that Adonai will work through. A sovereign outpouring of his fire. It's the only answer to the storm. Fire fights fire. He's moving like 50 years ago, but this harvest will be even greater. Millions will come to Yeshua. Israel will come to Yeshua. And it is exactly the same pattern Yeshua used. Yeshua engaged in Lador Vador in a radical and transformative manner. I shared this several years ago to a class for the YMJ at the Messiah Conference. He went to the millennials of his age, the young people. Yeshua did. You have peer influence through social media. People will and are listening to you. You're the new wineskins for the new wine that's being poured out. You must find your voice and interject yourselves into our nation's crisis with the love and the power of Yeshua. Listen to me. You all know who Dr. Martin Luther King is, right? He's a pastor who took leadership of the civil rights movement in 1955 at the age of 26, 26 years old. All but one of Yeshua's Talmudim was under the age of 20. Which one? Peter was over the age of 20. And of course, Yeshua who was somewhere between 30 to 33 years old. How do I know this? Because Exodus 30 verses 13 through 14 records that a half shekel tax was collected and paid by those who were 20 years of age and older. So when we read in Matthew 17, verses 24 through 26, the tax collectors for the half shekel came to Kafar Nachum to Capernaum. They came to Peter and said, hey, doesn't your rabbi pay the temple tax? And he said, of course he does. When he arrived home, Yeshua spoke first. Shimon, Peter, what's your opinion? The kings of the earth, from who do they collect duties and taxes? From their sons or from others? From others, he answered. Then Yeshua said, the sons are exempt. But to avoid offending them, go to the lake, throw out a line, take the first fit you fish you catch, open his mouth, you'll find a shekel, take it and give it to them for me and for you. Yeshua provided for the temple tax supernaturally for himself and for Peter. What about the others? It's not required because they were all teenagers. The group that turned the world upside down were young adults. They were under the age of 20. Adonai is doing it again with you. As Messianic believers, you retain a unique understanding and the truth of the kingdom and the word that is the answer to our national crisis. It says you have been given the ministry of reconciliation and to you rests the revival of Israel. It's a blood issue that we're suffering in this nation and it will not be fixed in Washington, D.C. No other group can do what Adonai is wanting to do. This new fresh Messianic outpouring and sovereign move of Adonai cannot be compared to anything that has previously or currently existed because there's nothing like it. The books of Acts supernatural record what happened when Yeshua's commands and teachings were followed. Signs and wonders, chapter after chapter after chapter. 3,000 get saved, 5,000 get saved, and they were you, the young Jewish Messianic movement of 2,000 years ago. The world was radically transformed forever for the kingdom, and you, the next generation of young Messianic Jewish Talmudim, are about to do it again. If you would just raise your hands, I want to pray over you right now and release this mandate because I'm at the birthplace of America where slavery started, where slavery ended, where the first Jews came to America, where anti-Semitism anti began, it all started right here in Virginia. And I want to release this to you that you may interject and change history, shifting it forever to bring life healing, restitution, equality, and justice for all in this nation. Abba, Father, in Yeshua's name, I just pray right now. 
here from the Eastern Gate of America, from Virginia, and I release to every person that's listening and watching here this evening, those who are on YouTube, who understand what this is about, and that you will fill them with your dutimous power, that signs and wonders will follow them that believe, and that you will give them great boldness, great boldness to interject themselves into the crisis of this nation. They are social influencers, Father God. Let them take command of all their media and websites and speak truth into this situation. Let them go to our cities. Let them stand arm in arms, Jew and Gentile, Black, White, Asian, Hispanic, and Native American, and let the love we have for one another Reveal the power of your kingdom in Yeshua to a darkened and dying world. Father God, I'm asking for supernatural outpouring of your fire upon every person, every young person here this evening. They are our hope. They are the source of revival. And we're lifting them up now and saying, take the baton. Do it. Bring revival, which will bring revival to the nation, the land, and the people of Israel. We thank you, Father, that America's destiny is not over. God has not done with America, and you are releasing them to the fullness of their destiny to bring life, healing, and restoration to a dying nation. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi Eric, for sharing with us tonight. God has placed a mantle on this generation to carry the work of the kingdom forward. And in the spirit of what he said, I just want to invite all of us. Now we have an opportunity to say, how can we join in in this work? We want to take an opportunity to say, God, how can we join in in what you're doing through the YMJA? And so right now, I just want to encourage you that if you have been blessed by the conference this week, if you have heard God's voice, if you have been encouraged and challenged, then I want to let you know that right now we have an opportunity to support the work of the YMJ so that we can join in and seeing God continue to do these awesome things. And so in the chat right now on Zoom, we're going to put up the link to the YMJ website. And on YouTube, if you look in the description, there's a link there where you can go to ymja.org slash donate. And so God has been faithful to the YMJ to do amazing things. Like Rabbi Eric said, God did awesome things in the 1960s and birthing the YMJA, and God wants to continue to do awesome things. And so I just want to encourage you that if you're in the YMJ or if you're a parent, if you're in this movement, together we can support this work to see it go forward, to see young men and women launched into their calling, trained and equipped to continue what God has started in the Messianic movement, because what God started, he will bring to completion until the day of Yeshua's returning. And that's our hope. And so I just want to encourage you to pray, to say, God, how can I sacrificially give and support the work that you're doing in the young people in our, in our movement? And so I just want to encourage you to do that. And I also want to let you know about some other opportunities for you in moving forward with God. We mentioned earlier the TLV Bible app. And so if you're watching on YouTube and you haven't had the chance to download that yet, you can do that. And for everyone who's watching us on YouTube, we've had raffles all week in the YMJ for free Bibles. And that's available to all of you watching on YouTube as well. Just download the TLV Bible app, download the app, click share, click with the YMJ button, and that'll take you to a page for the raffle, and you can win a free Bible from the TLV Bible Society to help you continue in your relationship with God. And we're grateful for the TLV and the work that they have done in stewarding a Messianic Jewish translation of the Bible so that we can continue in our faith together, knowing the identity of Messiah and seeing that, his Jewish identity in the scriptures. I also want to let you guys know that there are awesome opportunities available to all of us in the YMJ and so many more young adults through the Jewish Voice Ministries International. And right now we've got a video from JVMI to share with you about ways where you can join in and the great things God is doing there. Shalom YMJA. I'm Ezra and my wife Tamar, and we want to send you greetings from Jewish Voice Ministries International here in our currently 108 degree hometown of Phoenix AZ. We're so happy everybody's able to get together this year for a virtual Messiah conference, even though we couldn't all be together face to face. And in case you didn't know, we wanted to let you know you have the opportunity 
young people to come with us to serve Jewish communities in Ethiopia and Zimbabwe, places and people groups you may never have heard of who identify as Jewish and who are in need of your help. We provide free medical, dental, and eye care and the opportunity to share our faith in Yeshua with people who desperately need to hear that message. And, you know, Tamar and I actually met on, uh, on a Jewish voice outreach. I was serving on staff uh, in 2016, and Tamar came with us from Israel uh, on her first outreach. So uh, just saying, if anybody's in the market, uh, come with us on an outreach. But Tamar, tell them a little about your first experience. Yeah, so my first experience was in the end of May 2016. And I was working at the time, and I didn't have vacation days left, so my salary would be less, and I would have to pay for my ticket, and like just more money that I had together. But um, when I came back from the outreach, I felt so filled up, like really inside, there's this feeling that I can't describe, and who, who remembers the money that I had to pay for it? Really, I came back so blessed and so filled up, uh, just serving these people. And another cool thing that we do, like beyond the medical outreaches, mm -hmm. is that we plant um, congregations around Africa. Yeah. So these people that we serve, they actually have, if they're interested, they have a congregation that we can plant them in, and they can like be connected more and um, learn about our Yeshua our Messiah. That's right. So uh, gospel outreach, medical and humanitarian outreach, and congregational planting. There's a place for you, even if you're not sure how do I get involved, but something inside you saying I need to get involved. Contact us, JewishVoice.org. Three more outreaches this year, even in the midst of COVID. We are planning to go twice to Zimbabwe and once more to Ethiopia this year. And we're going to release 2021 outreach dates very shortly. So come with us, get involved. There's a limited number of partial scholarships available, so look into that as well. Contact us at Jewish Voice and have a great conference and a great summer. Bye-bye. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jewish Voice, for sharing those opportunities with us. We're grateful for you. And I just want to encourage you to check out those opportunities. Well, God has more great in stuff store in, for us this evening. And I'm excited to introduce our final speaker for tonight in the culmination of YMJ Night, in the culmination of our 2020 Vision Conference. And you met her before. She's our vice president. And I can say that behind the scenes, all throughout the year, she spends so much time pouring into the YMGA so that each of us can receive everything that God has for us. She is incredible in all the work that she does. And so tonight, I'm excited for us to receive the word that God has placed on her heart for us tonight. So join me in welcoming the YMJ Vice President and Conference Coordinator, Melissa Brown. I want to start by asking you a question, okay? And that question that I want to ask you is, what is holding you back? What is holding you back? What is holding you back from diving headfirst into the plans that God has for you? What is holding you back from experiencing the fullness of joy and love from the Lord? What is holding you back from blindly trusting God's word and his promises when all hope feels lost or when the future feels wildly unclear. That's what we're going to explore tonight. As we explore this together, I am going to hope and ask that you actively engage with me in this walking, this journey together, and not just listen as I speak, but really truly use this time to reflect on your own hopes, your own dreams, goals, and prayers for the future. If you have a notepad or a piece of paper or a pen or a pencil or just something to write with and write on, I want you to pull it out and let's start rolling. Are we ready? I can't see you, but I'm assuming you're either giving me a thumbs up or nodding your head or saying yes or something and you're ready to roll. All right, let's begin. As I was seeking God's insight for this message, there were a few things that I just kept feeling like God was speaking to me about that I needed to share. And one of them, was this question, what is holding you back? What is holding you back? And I started thinking about all the reasons why we and why I get weighed down and held back from the fullness of beauty and the fullness of joy and the fullness of peace that God has for us to come in the future. We all have things that we want or we hope for or we think about for the future. 
Maybe it's things that we see in our future that we would really rather avoid. Maybe it's a goal we want to accomplish, a change you want to see happen and happen well, a change you don't want, but you know is inevitable, a diagnosis you want to be healed from and overcome, busyness or a burden that you want lifted, something you want to see added to your life, a desire for a relationship or for children, a void that you need filled, something new that's coming into your life, a strained relationship that you need wisdom in, family salvation. Maybe you don't know what's to come and you don't know what that thing is and you want to. All of us have thoughts and goals and hopes and plans for our future. It would be unrealistic to expect us not to. But so why do them, why do some of them happen and some of them not? Why do some of them not happen in the timeline we want them to? Or why do the ones that we want to not happen happen? What is holding it all back? What makes it so hard for us to fully let go and let God take over? Because let's be real. Sometimes we say to ourselves or to the Lord or to friends or to other people that we are giving our future fully over to the Lord. And yet we still keep thinking about it or planning parts of it and trying to work it all out. For example, for those of us that are not married or single, how many of us, I'm sure, have genuinely or sincerely said to the Lord, God, I give my future husband or my future wife to you. Let it be done in your timing. I trust you. I want your plan for my future relationship and marriage. Whatever you provide for me, I release it to you. And then the minute somebody attractive, somebody who's remote, a remote possibility walks by, you immediately start to be like, all right, look, God, look, I know I told you that you'd be running the show here, but like, if I could just like take over maybe for a second, maybe handle this one, plan some details, talk to my friends and my Jewish mother, uh, maybe just like run through some possible scenarios that I had in mind, brainstorm. No, that is not how fully releasing things to the Lord works. We don't get to take it back and run it ourselves. So why do we do that? Because let's be real, so many of us, whether it's about marriage or something else, we have done that in some form or fashion, in some situation where we either try to figure out everything ourselves, make things happen for ourselves, or where we doubt God's will or that he even has a perfect will for our lives. So why? What is holding us back? Are you ready to run through some reasons with me? All right, take some notes. And by the way, I want us to look at these to not become overly hard on ourselves or critical or frustrated that we've allowed these things to become factors in our lives, but to identify them, to overcome them, and to be proud of our progress. Okay, reason number one need for control. This one is for all the planners out there and the ones who crave control and order. I see you. I feel you. I'm one of you. It's this feeling or this worry that if the details are out of our hands, that they will be done wrong or not at all, or that things outside of our control won't make sense. Or maybe you've seen or been taught through experiences that when you lack control, everything falls apart. Full faith in the Lord may seem like a weakness or like you're failing what you've built your day to day around. But what we fail to see is that when you let God fully take over, you allow for his plan to be fulfilled, for true happiness to be found and for the loss of stress and constant anxiety that you're plagued with as you so try as you try so hard to control what you just simply can't and aren't supposed to and never could in the first place number 2 fear of the unknown and nervousness over the possibility of change i for years struggled with this worry that when things were good, that the other shoe was bound to drop eventually. That this goodness was only gonna last so long before things flipped and got rough. How on earth could I trust an unknown future to a God that I didn't even really understand? 
But the Lord tells us that we can trust him in all things, even the ones we have no clue about what they look like, which let's be real is basically everything. He gave us a whole section in Hebrews 11 to tell us what this type of faith looks like. I want to read it now. Let's start Hebrews 11, one to three. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. I'm only going to read a small portion of this tonight, but I really encourage you to read the rest of the chapter and really soak it in because these miracles of faith that he carried out all throughout the Bible, guess what? They're not just miracles of faith for then. They will happen in the same ways now if we ask God to show us and to release them in our lives. We will never understand there are certain things about the Lord. I will never be able to understand how God has just always existed or how space goes on forever or how he created the whole earth just with his voice or his breath. But yet we trust and we have faith that that is true and that happened. And in the same way, we may never understand how God is going to bring us miracles and answers to prayers and breakthroughs and change because we, with our earthly eyes, have literally no ability to see what God is planning in the heavenly realm unless he speaks to us and gives us a glimpse into it. It can be such a challenge to blindly trust and have faith in what God is doing. And I want to say here too, that not all change is caused by God. We live in a sinful and a fallen world where the enemy is constantly attacking and at work. We will never understand the inner workings of the forces of good and evil. It is all completely outside of our earthly knowledge, but God says that he will work all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his will. So even through divorce, even through losing loved ones, even through moving away, through all of the changes and the unknowns, faith is a challenge. Faith is a choice. Every single day, we have to make the choice to trust God and have faith in his will and say, God, I believe you. I believe that you are working all things for my good according to your will. And walk in that. Let your words match your actions. And then God will start to open up our eyes to the things unseen. He will show us his will and how he is working on our behalf in the heavenly realm. Number three, focus on the impermanent and the material and our personal happiness. It is so wildly easy to put technology, money, social media, people before God. Those are the things that are tangible, right in front of our eyes, unable to be avoided. Plus, we have this knowledge and this understanding that God will always be there, that he's never going anywhere. Whereas we so often feel like people are going to leave us or walk out of our lives or betray us, and that we will lose out on opportunities for money or for wealth or furthering our own selves or being affirmed or popular in person or online because those are the impermanent things that we forsake the Lord and give all of our time and some energy to. But wait a minute, hold on. Let's take a step back for a second and think about this because I just said that people, money, social media, popularity, homes, jobs, cars, all of those things are impermanent, not permanent. And God is permanent. And we'll always be there. So why are we so worried about what other people will think of us if we raise our hands to praise God or pray out loud or worried about putting down our phones and logging out of social media for God forbid a day to spend time with the Lord and listen to his voice first when we literally just recognized that all of those other things are not permanent. 
And God is and will never leave us or forsake us. Why aren't we putting our priority in the Lord who is always here for us? I want to flip just one chapter over from where we just were to Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Yeshua, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Number four, need to look back instead of forward. I think it's funny that Rabbi Eric was just talking about uh, the Israelites and, and looking back to Egypt because I can't help but think about the Israelites as they were walking through the desert for 40 years. They had just been brought out of Egypt by God, majorly showing up in miraculous ways. And they were seeing God like descend upon them in a cloud and, and speak directly to them and to Moses. And they were being guided by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And yet they were continually getting stubborn and frustrated and rebellious because they were complaining about how in Egypt they could eat all the fish and the cucumbers and the melons and the onions and the garlic, but in the wilderness, they had only manna. They complained saying, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the swords? Our wives and children will be taken in plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? They couldn't stop using the baseline of the past and the things that happened in the past to dictate their expectations for the future. They weren't allowing themselves to be hopeful and full of faith for the future, even though God was clearly doing miracles for them. And actually all of their grumbling and their doubting made God take them on a longer journey through the wilderness. Our relationships with God may feel stagnant because we are so stuck in the past, beating ourselves up over the past, thinking about what happened or what we did rather than what could. Many of you have had incredibly hard pasts, ones that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. These experiences have given you the thought or the expectation that maybe there's, there's no way that the future could be any different or any better that your past can't be redeemed or that because of your past choices, the future couldn't possibly be as beautiful. But I am here right now to rebuke that lie and tell you that the Lord has the most beautiful and wonderful things in store for you. No longer do the things of your past dictate the things of your future. No longer do you need to look to the past, no matter what your past looks like, to paint the picture of expectation for your future. Your future is in the Lord's hands and he has the most beautiful promises and miracles and breakthroughs in store. Number five, inability to trust what you know in your heart is true. Just like the Israelites, we so often find it hard to believe that God has a beautiful future for us or that he will hold true to his promises, no matter what we have seen, experienced, or think. About seven years ago, our family received news that no one should ever hear. I'm gonna to try to keep it together for this, guys. My mom was diagnosed with cancer. Immediately, my mind began running with every story that I heard about people losing their parents to cancer and every friend and family member who had lost a battle with cancer. I became numb and I couldn't believe that this was happening to me and possibly my future. At the time of diagnosis, God spoke very clearly to my mom, who was asking God all kinds of questions of her own. And God told her, 30. She would be healed to the number 30. Now, my mom, being the overachiever that she is, uh, wanted to see zero as her tumor marker numbers. 
the cancer is measured in tumor marker numbers that we want to see drop. Well, come to find out a few weeks later from her doctor that zero actually wouldn't be healthy. The healthiest number she could get to with her tumor markers would be 30. The last seven years, our family has been on quite the journey and we've had to cling to the Lord's promises for healing and for 30 amidst every side effect, every fear and every disappointing report. Whenever people ask me how I'm doing or processing all of the ups and downs of her health journey and what our family is walking through, my response is usually, I'm just following in my mom's lead. Because the Lord has used this season to grow her faith beyond what I could have ever thought possible for a person's faith to be. She has rooted herself so deeply in God's word, his promises of 30, and in his voice alone. That's not to say that the enemy doesn't attack her or attack us or that she doesn't feel the strategies of the devil because she openly shares with us that she does. But having a front seat to her journey to be healed from cancer and having a miraculous testimony to share constantly reminds me of 1 Corinthians 13, 6 to 7 that says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. It would be so easy for her or for our family to look around us and tell ourselves to walk in worry or fear because of what we've seen. That isn't to say that we shouldn't be open and honest with ourselves and with others when we're struggling because we have to, we have to be. But what I am saying is that we must cling to truth, cling to the promises of God, and of which there are many throughout the Bible, even if you're not giving your own personal promise and speak in faith, even if we fake it until we make it, even if we don't yet believe God's truth, there is a power in speaking it out. Even if your voice shakes, because the more we speak truth, the more it will take root in our thoughts and in our actions. And we will begin to shift more and more to believing it. And number six, negative self-image or self-deprecating thoughts. As I just talked about speaking truth, we must do that over our own selves. We live in a world that is constantly causing us to critique ourselves or to be hard on ourselves or to feel like we aren't doing enough or we aren't good enough, whether it be in earthly things or spiritual things. No one ever said that our walks with the Lord would be easy or that they would come without hurdles. The devil is constantly, constantly at work trying to trip us up and trigger us enough so that we will fall back to the sinful ways or doubt the Lord's will. He knows exactly what will make each and every one of us start to think that we can't or we won't be worthy of good things. Those are the strategies that are way bigger than ourselves. And we cannot allow ourselves to become hard on our own selves for it. God is a God of love. He is a God of encouragement. And anything that does not build us up or bring us closer to the Lord is not of him. Petra said last night in her message, and it is so true that struggle does not equal weakness. Struggle equals humanity. Avi Shalom said in his message on Sunday that the voice of God brings life and love. And the voice of the devil brings guilt and shame. Something that God put on my heart for this message is a song that recently was released by Corey Asbury called The Father's House. I want to read some of the lyrics because they are so powerful and such truth that we should speak over ourselves. And I encourage you to find and listen to this song later tonight. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over. My story's just begun. And failure won't define me because that's what my father does. Lay your burdens down here in the father's house. Check your shame at the door. It ain't welcome anymore. You're in the father's house. Arrival's not the end game. The journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect. 
You just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the father's in the room. Tonight, I wanna challenge each of us to invite our heavenly father into the room, to ask the Lord to take over and fully release even thinking about things that aren't ours in the first place to figure out, to take all of those hopes and goals and dreams and prayers for the future and allow God to lead you as you walk together through this journey, to overcome whatever is holding you back from fully and truly believing that whatever God has for you is good. If you are here tonight and you have never asked God to be the center of your life, and made a choice to fully walk with him and give your whole heart and your whole past, present, and future to him. I want to invite you to pray with me tonight. But also, if you are here tonight and you have prayed the prayer of salvation in the past, but you have strayed away from him and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord and start fresh tonight, I want to invite you to also pray this prayer with me tonight. And for everybody else that's here, I ask that you either raise your hands or extend your hands to the screen to join with us together as one community and one body to join with those who are praying this prayer tonight. All right, so if you are praying this prayer, pray it either out loud or in your heart after me. Dear God, I come before you and ask for your forgiveness. I know I've strayed far from you and I pray that you will bring me back. Bring me close to your heart. I believe that you have saved me and that you are the Lord of all creation. I want you to be the center of my life and I want to live putting your will first and foremost. I believe that you have a future and a hope special for me. And I wanna live that future as your child. Lord, come into my heart and my life today so that I may choose you every day. Thank you, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. If you said that prayer tonight, reach out, let somebody know, get accountability, seek godly wisdom and counsel. Feel free to reach out to me or to any of our YMJ leaders. We are so thrilled that you have made this decision tonight to walk with the Lord for the rest of your days. And I can only imagine that heaven is rejoicing. As we close out this YMJ conference and our service together, I think it's only fitting that we receive a blessing from the Lord that he gave to the people of Israel thousands of years ago, and that is still true today. So I wanna turn it over to Marty and Misha for the Aaronic Benediction. Hi, YMJA, I am Misha and this is Marty. We are so glad to be sending you off in the final moments of your online conference. We hope that this conference has been a blessing to you, that you've made lots of friendship and learned lots of lessons. And we're going to declare the erotic benediction from the book of Numbers 6, 24 through 26 over you as we go and receive this blessing. And his face and his 
Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Well, this has been an incredible conference together. I am so glad that we could be all a part of this together from all around the globe. And, uh, and it's just been an amazing week that in a world filled with uncertainty and chaos, we can be a people of 2020 vision because we know our God has blessed us and will keep us because of Yeshua and what he's done. And so as we just celebrate what God has done in our lives this week, I just know from different, everything you do on Zoom, you got to end with a bang. And so as we celebrate what God did this week, let's end with a dance party. So if you're watching on Zoom, stand up and we'll all dance together and just celebrate the awesome stuff God has done this week. So hit it.
Oh, my God.